And so, Lord, specifically with what we'll be talking about tonight, I pray so much so that your word would please mold us. God, would you please just purge our pride, purge any apathy, purge any unteachability, purge everything that isn't of you, God. All distractions, anything that we may have done in the past year, month, day, or today, or whatever it may have been, God, just wash everything away and help us to just walk in that newness of life, just as your word tells us to. And so, Lord, we give you full reign tonight. God, we're excited for what you're going to share with us uh, through your word, and we just want to hear from you. Lord, that's why we're here. We're just your children wanting to hear from you and to sit at your banqueting table and just be fed by you and be fed by your word. And so, Lord, we love you, and we pray that by the end of our time together that we would love you so much more. We just pray all these things in the name and for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, let's turn to James chapter 1. I know. It is the last Sunday of the month, and so to follow uh, in suit with our topicals on the last Sunday of the month, we'll be talking about wisdom. Wisdom, living God's life, or living life God's way. But now that we're all in James, someone please read loud and clear James chapter 1, verse 5. I know, Jess, not anymore. If any of you lacks... James 1, 5. If any of you... If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all, without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Now... All of us either go to school, or we have a job, or we interact with human beings in some way. Uh, hence, you're all here, <laughs> we're all interacting with each other in some way. And you're interacting with each other by not getting up and maybe throwing your chair, or, you know, spouting off crazy things. So even in not, even in not doing something, we're still interacting with one another. And so, what we're going to be talking about today is dissecting this topic, this word called wisdom. What is wisdom? How do we apply wisdom? And often when we talk about wisdom, it seems like this ethereal kind of just spiritual uh, concept that we don't really understand or know how to apply when wisdom is what it all comes down to. Uh, Wisdom is application, and there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is theoretical, wisdom is application. Knowledge is information, and Wisdom is actually knowing what to do rightly with that information. And so with that all being said, let's flip over a uh, page to chapter 3. And this is where we're going to be primarily tonight. It's chapter 3, verse 13 through 18. Now verse 13, he goes on and he says, this is James who is the half-brother of Jesus. He got saved after the resurrection. We know that from 1 Corinthians 15. I just have to set the stage for you, set the context for you. Uh, He got saved after the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, We know that from 1 Corinthians 15. And he didn't just receive the Lord and then live his life like the way he used to. Uh, He received the Lord as his Savior, and he actually went on to become the church leader in Jerusalem. We know that from Acts chapter 15, as well as other portions of Acts as well. And not only was he the senior pastor, so to speak, of the church in Jerusalem, but he also was the one whom Paul the Apostle came to for counsel. We know that from the latter part of Acts. And so uh, this guy, James, he isn't just Joe Schmo from down the road. Uh, He's an extremely wise individual. In fact, many people call him James the Righteous. The letter of James would be uh, called the Proverbs of the New Testament. And just to kind of give you um, a little bit more, is that if you really want to know wisdom, you really want to know how to live life God's way, read a proverb a day. A proverb is written by the wisest guy who ever lived apart from Jesus. And he wrote all about wisdom, all about understanding, all about knowledge. And in fact, what Solomon says, that's King David's son, Solomon who wrote Proverbs, what he says is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of understanding, and it's also the beginning of wisdom. And so in order to even attain this wisdom, before even understanding it or applying it or any of those things, 
we need to actually fear God. And this isn't just that uh, respect like towards a boss or respect towards a parent. No, this is respect towards God. The very one whom Jesus says can cast your body and your soul into hell. So there is supposed to be a healthy fear here. Of course we love Him. Of course we adore and worship Him. Yes, He's our Heavenly Father. Yes, He's our friend. Yes, He's the King of Kings. We get to go before His throne freely and with boldness according to Hebrews. But we also have to remember who He is. He is still God. And He's not our homeboy. He's not, you know, <laughs> any just uh, lackadaisical relationship. Uh, he's God. He's holy. He's reverent. And so, uh, with that being said, let's start pulling out our scalpels uh, and our magnifying glasses and let's kind of start cutting into this. Verse 13. So, this James, half-brother of Jesus, he talks to the persecuted Jewish Christians, that's the context, Acts chapter 8, verse 1, if you want to jot that down, and he says, who is wise and understanding? Notice those two words, wisdom and understanding. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct. Notice not by good words. Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. And so, this is a challenge because if anyone claims to be wise, then that will be shown by the actions of your day-to-day -day life. It's not what you did when you're on a missions trip. It's not what you did when you went to a conference and how spiritual you know you were, raising your hands and singing all the songs as loud as you can, and to where you're a horse in your voice. That's not wisdom. That's not application of wisdom. What is wisdom? It is this daily living, daily living. Of course, my clerk always decides to. Uh, go out every once in a while. And so, if, if you read throughout the book of James, you'll notice how it's constantly application. In fact, there's 59 commands in 108 verses. 59 commands is a lot of commands in just five uh, relatively short chapters. And so he's constantly applying, constantly telling us how to live uh, the way that would be pleasing to God, constantly challenging our faith. And this is one of the absolute main points. Because if we don't have this, if we don't have wisdom, Everything else doesn't really stand. But as we go through this, we'll talk about even the foundation of wisdom. But we'll get to that towards the end. And so what is wisdom? Well, what is wisdom according to what we just talked about? Who's got it? Application, right? Something else we said is that it's the right use of knowledge. Because there can be really wrong uses of knowledge, right? A pinnacle example is someone like Hitler. Hitler was an extremely intelligent individual, great administrator, great leader, uh, excellent dictator, very smart. But did he use his knowledge rightly? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And so knowledge is the right, or wisdom is the right application of knowledge. Now he uses this word understanding in the Greek. And this is the Greek word epistemon. And this is the only time you see this word anywhere throughout the New Testament. And it means with much knowledge or skilled or experienced. And that's really the key part. Because you guys remember those two Greek words for knowledge? Really there's eight, but we've talked about two a few times. It's oida and gnosko. Who remembers what oida means? You're going to have to dig way in the back of your mind. Sid. <laughs> oh, it means head knowledge, right? And what does gnosko mean? Not Sid. <laughs> huh? Okay, yeah. Go, yeah, go along with that. It's like gnosko in Spanish. Who said that? My wife. I heard that from somewhere over there. <laughs> I heard this still small voice over there. Absolutely right. Knowledge by experience. So good. Yes. And so that's what James is talking about. It's not head knowledge that you get from like listening to someone up here. It's not something you get from books or watching videos or listening to other people's stories. But it's actually knowledge by experience. It's not sympathy, but it's empathy. And so this is what he's talking about understanding. And this is the question that James is asking. Who of you thinks they're knowledgeable and who of you thinks actually knows how to use that knowledge rightly? 
and to all of us here at College and Career Group at First Christian Church, 21st Century Southern Californians, he's asking us this exact same question. Who of you thinks you're wise? Who of you thinks that you're really knowledgeable? Show me, not by your words, show me by your works. Show me by what you do. It doesn't matter what you say, it matters what you do. So we're going to see the true outworking of wisdom and understanding. And we're going to contrast this because he's going to talk about demonic wisdom. There is such a thing as demonic wisdom. I think Hitler had that one down well. And then there's godly wisdom. And that's what we're going to be finishing off on. Now he says, let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. This good conduct is anastrophe, uh, used 13 times. And it means a behavior or manner of life. Again, it's not just spurts of wisdom, but this is a constant lifestyle. Not just what you do on Sundays, but what you do also on Monday. When you hate Mondays and you don't want to get up for school or for work or whatever, and you're just dreading, you know, like sluggishly out of bed uh, to get up. Yes, wisdom, God's wisdom plays a part in that as well. Verse 21, we see that word man, where you're, you're gentle and you're lowly and you're humble before other people, but you're also gentle before the Lord. Now, what does gentle before the Lord mean? That's not just some pie in the sky kind of, you know, spiritual phrase. Gentleness before God, it's best summed up in just teachability. Are you teachable? Are you willing to be molded? Or are you this granite or hard rock that just, <laughs> there's no budging, there's no molding this? Or are you literally saying, God, here's my heart, here's my mind, here's my soul, my desires, my, what I want to find entertaining, here's my goals? God, mold that. Mold that, however it is that you want. That's gentleness, that's meekness before God. And James is saying that if I say with my words I'm wise, then that ought to show in my actions, in my meekness with other people, as well as my meekness before the Lord, one-on-one. -on -one. Character, which is what you do when no one is watching. Are you meek even in that kind of situation? Now, verse 14, he goes on and he says, But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. Now, this word bitter is this sharp or harshness. Envy is often translated zeal or even jealousy. And self-seeking is eretheia. It means strife or selfishness, this rivalry. And this self-seeking thing that he's talking about, and this is all part of demonic wisdom, this self-seeking really has the connotation of dividing people. It's like party-making, uh, like Republican-Democrat uh, or one denomination against another and they don't want to talk because you know that church uses drums and electric guitars and we just sing hymns only hymns it can only be hymns God only listens to hymns he doesn't listen to Hillsong God doesn't listen to you know fill in the blank that's division that's worldly demonic wisdom and how often that kind of stuff creeps in into the church, which is unfortunate. Now, to say that I'm a wise person and yet be sharp or harsh with my words, have this negative jealousy or right? jealousy over bad things, because you can have a good jealousy. The Bible talks about how God's a jealous God. There is definitely a healthy jealousy. I'm totally jealous for my wife. Uh, I would be very <laughs> uh, displeased if her affections went towards someone else, right? Another male. Heck yeah, I'm going to be jealous. I'm going to want her affection. I'm going to want her love, and I want her to want my love as well. And that's the exact same jealousy that God is talking about, right? We're the bride of Christ. He's our bridegroom. It's the same relationship, but it's this negative, unhealthy jealousy, wanting what other people have type of jealousy. You can also equate with covetousness. Now, if I say that I'm a wise person, but I have that ungodly zeal, I cause strife, I, I divide people, I have gossip, um, or I lie, all of this is boasting against the truth. It's boasting against God. And so have, to have these true in my life and to still call myself wise is to really deceive myself. I'm deceiving myself by saying, yeah, I think I'm a pretty you know, wise or knowledgeable guy. But if I have any of these kinds of traits you know, true in my life, no, I'm just deceiving myself. James talks all about that in chapter 1. He talks about how the Bible 
this book that we all get to hold in our hands, that this Bible's like a mirror. And when you look in the mirror, you're obviously looking at yourself, but you're looking at what needs to be changed, right? When you get up in the morning, and I'm assuming we all have a mirror that we look at at some point in the morning or when we're, before we leave the, our apartment or house or wherever, if you look in the mirror when you get up and you see there's stuff in your teeth, your hair is all disheveled, you know, you look all tore up from the floor up. Do you want to go outside or go to work or go to school or go to an interview looking like that? No. There's so much hope. Obviously not. The mirror is telling you to comb your hair, you got to brush that mouth, you got to put on some know, more professional clothes, you got to fix some stuff, right? There's going to need to be some massive change, maybe take a shower, because the covering off of you, maybe after a week, things need to be changed, right? That's the purpose of a mirror. And James says, if you look into the mirror of God's word, and you don't change, and yet you walk out into the world and think everything's okay, you're deceiving yourself, and you look like trash. And if you dare claim to be a Christian, and you don't, you know, start fixing some stuff up, or pray God starts fixing you up, you not only make the Lord look bad, you make all of his people look bad. That's a bummer. Maybe that's why so many people don't want to go to church. Because they've seen a whole lot of tore up people who've looked into the mirror of God's word and still think that they're okay and they don't need to change anything. May that never be true of us. May that, man, may that never be true of me. That people wouldn't want to have a relationship with God or go to church or read his word because they look at me and say, Sean, you're a hypocrite. Whew. That would hurt. That would hurt a lot. And so, this is all that he's talking about. Wisdom, right? Now, this all goes back to what's in the heart. What is in our heart? And Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And I think that verse means a whole lot more than we really give that verse credit for. And here's why. When you talk to someone, and I'm assuming we all talk to someone <laughs> in some way, right? Whether it's a friend, spouse, uh, you know, boss, coworkers, whatever. I'm assuming you all talk to at least one person <laughs> apart from the Lord. When you talk to people, what you or that other person talk most about often indicates what's in their heart, what's consuming their heart, what's consuming their mind. For example, I'm sure we all have some athletic friend, right? Someone who plays basketball or football or track or whatever kind of athletics. And you know that person always talks about sports. They claim to be a Christian, maybe they go to FCA or whatever, you know, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. But if they talk way more about sports, what probably fills their heart and their mind? Sports. A musician, if they talk all about like going to Guitar Center and buying this new thing or like, oh man, I learned this new whatever. You guys don't go to Guitar Center? <laughs> Lame. That's right. Michael in the back. And so... What is that person probably consumed with? Music. If a person is always talking about Jesus <laughs> and the Bible and just the stuff that God's doing in their life and other people's lives and what they want to do in the future and like, what are they consumed with? Jesus, his word, that kind of stuff. So you get the idea, right? If you have a prolonged relationship with anyone, you can easily know I shouldn't say no fully, but you can get an indicator, right, where their heart's at by what they talk about. If they always talk about work or getting money, they're probably consumed with work and getting money. If they're always talking about, oh, I'm so in love with that girl or that boy or whatever, they're probably consumed with that girl or boy, right? And so think about the stuff that you talk about. Kind of go through a, a quick analysis of what you've talked about today. Actually, no, not today. It's Sunday. That'd be too easy. <laughs> <laughs> past Monday, right? Or maybe Friday, like right before the weekend hit or any other day but Sunday 
like just go through a quick analysis. Like, what do I talk the most about? Really. And that'll indicate what's really in your heart. Stuff to think about. And so, moving on to verse 15. He goes on, he says, this wisdom, and this wisdom he's talking about is this demonic, this earthly wisdom. He says, this wisdom does not descend from above, but it is earthly, sensual, and demonic. You always just love to just do your own thing, huh? (laughs) And so, earthly, sensual, and demonic. He uses these three different words here. Now, Earthly is obviously terrestrial, it's of the earth, and it's in contrast to heavenly, right? That's what he's about to get into. And the sensual word is psychikos, like psyche, right? What's inside your heart and your mind? It's the corrupt desires that spring up as of like dirty water from the mind or the soul of man. And of course, this is going to be contrast to the spiritual, the godly wisdom from above, the heavenly wisdom that he'll talk about. But he also uses this word demoniotis. The only time this word is used in the entire New Testament also. Now, originating, this is what this word means, originating and influenced by demons. Originating and influenced by demons. Daimonyotis. That's a pretty heavy word. And that's all talking about this earthly, sensual wisdom. And this wisdom of the world, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19, you can jot that verse down, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 19, says that this wisdom is of the earth and it is corrupt both in its desires and it's also corrupt in its motivations. And ultimately, it originates from Satan's rebellion. It originates with pride. Now, we're going to get into kind of a, a touchy thing right now. But know this. Anything that is, and this is specifically in the context of wisdom, Anything specifically within the context of wisdom that is not of God is from who? The enemy. Satan. Demons. Now, Satan is the ruler of this present age. That's what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. He's currently influencing the world in many ways. And he is influencing the world through political entities through a massive amount of cults and different world religions, through wars, all kinds of stuff. And his mission is to kill, to steal, and to destroy, as we know from John chapter 10, verse 10, from Jesus himself. Now, demons are influencing both non-believers as well as believers alike to get them as far away from God as possible. Now, think about that when you talk to people. Think about that when you talk to people specifically about the Bible or the Gospel, about Jesus. You ever notice how you can talk to them about anything else under the sun, you know, about Buddha or Mormonism or, you know, trying out this new fad or whatever, horoscopes, and it's like things are fine. But as soon as you bring up the name Jesus and how Jesus is the only way and how the word of the Bible is authoritative. Immediately there's like this animosity or there's like this short circuiting that's kind of going on inside. Of them. And they're just like, that doesn't sit well with me. There's a reason there's that outward I'm not saying they're literally tweaking out. But I, I'm trying to visually give you an idea what's going on in here. It's not only them that has a problem with that. You have to remember what are the spiritual influences behind that person that are influencing them to be like this. Why is it so hard to talk to our family members about Jesus? Why is it so hard to talk about our closest friends about Jesus? How, man, you need him. Not just because you're a dirty sinner and I know it, and you know it, but you need him because he's the only way. We all need him. It doesn't matter if you grew up in the church, you're the son of the Pope, or you know whatever. That would happen because you know, clearly you You know what I mean. <laughs> If such a thing were to happen. Hold that comments. But why is there that animosity? It's because there are demons influencing that person. 
there's a reason why Paul the Apostle talks to the Corinthians about how the weapons of our warfare aren't carnal. They aren't physical, and it's not just necessarily evidence and apologetics and history and archaeology and that kind of stuff. Because what have we talked about in the past, right? Man can touch the mind, but God can only touch the heart. We can give them all the facts and evidence and information. We can just break it down logically, step by step, that Jesus is the only way. The Bible is true. We can do that with, with what is available to us, the resources that are available to us. That doesn't mean someone is going to repent of their sins and give their life to Jesus. Because it's a heart issue, right? Which is why it says the weapons of our warfare aren't carnal, but are mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. Those strongholds are those demonic influences. Right, that's the context that he's talking in to the Corinthians. Talking about principalities, powers, and wickedness in high places. These are the things, the spiritual entities that are influencing the people that we talk to. And so think about that, guys. Think about that when you talk to them. And yes, share the gospel first always. And if you need to, get into the evidence. Start breaking it down logically why such and such is the case. But remember that that's not the end-all, be-all. You have to pray, and if you really care, you need to fast. You need to fast that demons would just be rebuked and be so far away as the east is from the west that they'd have no influence over that person to give their life to the Lord and have an eternal turning point. To no longer be on the eternal road of hell and ultimately the lake of fire, but to have that turning point to now be on the narrow road to eternal life through Jesus Christ. Think about that when you talk to them. Pray for them first. Review demons, right? You have authority in the Lord to do that uh, before you talk to anyone. And sometimes my prayers are as short as this. God, wisdom. Before I take a phone call, <laughs> before I talk to anyone, or no, have a meeting or something, uh, sometimes my prayers are that short because of just whatever the situation may be. But God knows. God knows the heart. And He answers those things. Um, with that being said, Please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Because how do we defend and combat against these spiritual, these spiritual enemies? And just to let you know, even angels and demons are fighting around us right now. We know that from passages like Daniel. When Daniel prayed, and the text in the Bible says that the command went forth, that it took the angel Gabriel three weeks, 21 days, to get from heaven back to Daniel with the message. Because there was a war going on in Persia, and it wasn't until the uh, angel Michael came and saved him that he actually was able to go and give the message back to Daniel. Man, spiritual warfare is going on even when we pray over food, <laughs> before worship, and definitely before the Word. There is all this demonic spiritual warfare going on because they want you to not listen. They want you to be hard-hearted. And even right now, I don't know where the state of your heart's at, but maybe I'm talking to you. Maybe your heart right now is saying, man, I really don't want to be here. Man, this is boring. Gosh, I hate this guy. Just kidding. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I really hope not. <laughs> but how do, we, how do we go against this? Thank you. <laughs> Someone please read Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 18. Loud and clear. 10 through 18, loud, strong voice.
with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the, of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit of all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Thank you. And so we know that these spiritual forces, this angelic and demonic warfare is going on constantly, 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 even when we sleep, constantly, constantly going on. And so how do we interact with that? How do we combat against those things? Because it's happening all the time, everywhere that you go, depending on shows that we watch, music we listen to, who we hang out with, everything. The enemy is trying to use it against us. Even the Bible, the enemy tries to use it against us. How do we know that? With Jesus himself, Satan tried to flip scripture and try to use it against the Son of God. And so Satan will even try to twist this around in your mind to try to get you to stray away from the truth. And so how do we combat against this? Defensively, we put on the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, right? The feet shod with the gospel, the preparation of peace, the, uh, the belt of truth. And how do we combat offensively? the sword of the Spirit. What did Jesus also do? He combated, in context, (laughs) Scripture as well. We've talked a lot about how, what are the three most important words when you study the Bible, or when you read the Bible? What are they? Context? Context. 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 Very good. Man, that was deep. Absolutely, right? Whenever you read and study the Bible, those are the three most important words. What are the verses before? What's he talking about? What's the historical context? You know, who is he talking to? Why is he talking to them? And what are the verses afterward, right? Context, context, context. The most important thing. And people like Jehovah's Witnesses, they are masters of the scriptures out of context. Oh my goodness, so many frustrating conversations with Jehovah's Witnesses. But that's all another story altogether. And so, but I want to bring it back to this, because this is really the clincher, this is the kicker right here. We talked about how specifically with regard to wisdom here, anything apart from God is from Satan. And isn't that a a heavy line? Isn't that a heavy dose of truth? And this could, this could preach for a lifetime. Anything that is not of God is of Satan. Anything that's not further conforming you into the image of Christ is from Satan. Now, does that sound like some radical truth? Not for Jesus. Not for the disciples. Not for anyone who genuinely wants to be like Christ. But you have to think about it like this. And you may think, oh, Sean, you're being too much. Oh, that's, you know, that's crazy. I'm trying to formulate this without sounding overly harsh for the sake of being harsh. So that's not at all my heart. I, I bring this up because God's Word brings it up and because Jesus lives it out, but because I love you. And I want us to be conformed to the image of Jesus no matter what, because that is the end all be all. That really is the end all be all. Anything that you listen to when you're driving on the radio, if that is not in some way edifying, what's edification? It's building up. If the stuff that you're listening to on the radio or on your iPod or that new CD that came out, you know, because there's new CDs coming out all the time, if that is not honoring to God, biblically, that's from Satan. Why and how? Because if it's not drawing you to Jesus biblically, what else is it going to draw you to? Seriously, what else is that going to draw you to? What did Jesus say? That broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many, many will go by it. But narrow, narrow is the way that leads to life. Narrow is the gate. And we've often forgotten that not only is the gate narrow, not only is Jesus who is the door, 
the way, the truth, and the life. Not only is that narrow, not by any other name under heaven can we be saved, but the only way is through him. That's a narrow gate out of all of the other gates we can choose. We've forgotten that not only is the, the, the gate narrow, but the way is narrow. The lifestyle is narrow. And it's not that you have these blinders on and you don't see the rest of the world around you. But it's the road that you're walking on. Yes, you see the rest of the world. You know how to combat against the rest of the world in love and in truth. But you do not stray off that narrow path. This is is so convicting in so many ways. Because you and I both know there are so many things that we do in our day that aren't honoring to God. Whether it's what we read or what we watch, like oh, almost everything on Netflix, <laughs> or that comes out in the movie theaters and Cinemark or whatever at the mall, almost everything is not honoring to God. Am I saying put blinders on and don't know about the world? Absolutely not. That's not what the Bible talks about. In fact, in Chronicles, it says that God's people knew the times that they were in. They knew the world that they were living in, and they knew what to do because of that. As Christians, we need to have our Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. Or in modern times, a Bible in one hand or a Bible app and a newspaper in one hand or a newspaper app. (laughs) Which what I do, what me and my wife do, we have you know, a few news sources that will just pop up, you know, certain things that are going on around the world. And we we keep up with the news and politics and, and things like that. Because we need to know what is going on in the world around us. So one, we know how to actually talk to people and we're not just like living under a rock somewhere (laughs) or in our holy huddle. But think about the life of Jesus. He lived with sinners. He ate with tax collectors and prostitutes and people in the world hated and looked down upon. He knew very well the world that he was living in. But he exercised wisdom on how to be in the world, but not what? But not of the world. Everything, guys, is influencing you in some way. What you watch, listen to, hang out with, Paul the Apostle says, don't be deceived, my beloved brethren, my beloved college and career group family. Don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. And that includes the things that you watch, listen to, and hang out with. But this line, this truth, it needs to be so deeply ingrained in us that anything that does not glorify God or conform you to the person of Christ is from Satan. You know what the saddest part about this is? And after I share this, we'll move on in our text. You know what the saddest part about this is, guys? The mass majority of us in this room, I'll put myself, myself in there as well, the mass majority of us in this room will look at this, will listen to all that's being shared, We will look into the mirror of God's Word. We will look at the lifestyle of Jesus Himself. And when we walk out this door, heck, even before we walk out this door, when worship is done and we all get up and we start talking and whatever, you know what the saddest part is? We will not apply this. The majority of you in here, I can almost guarantee it, you will not apply what is being shared to you. You know how I know that? Because that's what almost everyone else does. We won't take a serious look at what's on our iPod. We won't take a serious look at what we're watching or how we spend God's time, how we spend God's money. And we won't actually do this. I say that because I love you and I don't want that to be the case for you. And it's not like I'm just pointing the finger because you have to remember at least three fingers are pointing back at me. This applies to Sean Arviso 
more than it applies to you in a sense because it's actually coming from my mouth. There's a reason why I get so nervous, I get so nervous to share the Bible or to share God's truth with anyone. It's not so much because I think of the awkwardness <laughs> or I think of you know, what if I don't know what to say? I'll just take down their number and I'll get back to them later. If I don't know. And I'm not going to make stuff up. That's, don't ever do that. <laughs> but I get so nervous because I read stuff like James chapter 3 where he talks about how let not many of you become teachers because you will. You will. That is a promise from God and God follows through with His promises. You will undergo a stricter judgment. I get so nervous because I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't, I don't want to say something wrong. And guys, if I ever say something wrong, please rebuke me. I am openly asking slash begging you, please rebuke me if you ever see me do anything contrary to God's word. Please, I need that. I need that. But this needs to be applied, guys. And tonight's the night to do it. It's not when you go to a conference and you hear the exact same kind of stuff again. It's not when you go next Sunday morning and you hear maybe your pastor talking about something like this or you hear a podcast or you watch a YouTube sermon or whatever. <laughs> right now, as we're sitting down here at 8.22 p.m., April 24th, Right now, this needs to be true for us. Now, now we can move on. And we're going to, after we finish up demonic wisdom, <laughs> what we've been talking about, and you can flip back to chapter 3. We're going to start getting out of demonic wisdom, and we'll start ending on a much brighter note. <laughs> a much brighter note than that, on God's wisdom, godly wisdom from above, from heaven. Verse 16. James goes on and he says, For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Now, he uses this word confusion, akatastasia, and it means instability, but really like anarchy or a state of disorder, like national disorder. That's where this kind of stuff will be if there's uh, confusion or this demonic wisdom. Now, just... Take a moment on your own right now. Just read this verse again. I don't want us to skim over this, this text. Read this verse again just real briefly to yourself. Where there is jealousy and selfishness, there is confusion and evil. Everything rises and falls on its leadership, guys. Everything. Everything rises and falls on its leadership. Let me say that again. <laughs> everything, everything, everything rises and falls on its leadership. And there aren't only a select few of leaders. It's not just a CEO of a company. It's not just a manager in a corporation or at a store. It is not just the pastor. You are all leaders. Isn't that a radical truth? You are all leaders in some way. How do we know that? Because you have a sphere of influence. You influence someone, I can guarantee it. You influence someone in some way. You are a leader to someone in some way. Doesn't matter how old you are, how old in the Lord you are, how much of the Bible you know, you lead someone in some way. All of us are leaders. And everything rises and falls on its leadership. And as a leader, if you have any self-seeking in your heart, in any way, even if it's minute, I can guarantee you that will seep out eventually. You can't hide that forever. But that self-seeking in your heart will cause confusion. 
disorder, and ultimately allow the enemy to step in to your sphere of influence and to begin to crumble whatever it is that you're trying to do, whether it's in ministry or marriage or the family, school, work, whatever it may be. You're a leader. You are a leader. And everything rises and falls on its leadership. Which is why it's so important to apply what we're going to talk about next. Applying God's wisdom to live this life God's way. Which brings us now to verse 17. Things are going to start looking up. We're getting towards the light at the end of the tunnel. Things are brightening. You can hear the angels singing and the heaven's bells ringing. Right? We're coming towards the light here. But the wisdom that is from above, you can hear the angels in the choir and such, is first pure and then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality or without favoritism, and also without hypocrisy. I just turned myself off there. There we go. (laughs) Now, I want us to really break this down. This is where we're going to... Uh, kind of sharpen our scalpel a little bit. And now we're going to kind of just dig through some of these words here to get a really colorful picture about what does this really look like for me. Now, pure. And we're going to use this phrase often. God's wisdom, so on and so forth. Specifically with pure. God's wisdom makes the Christian in thought, word, and deed clean in spirit and body, in doctrine and practice, in faith and in your morals, God's wisdom makes you undefiled in all of those areas. Man, we could just stop right there and that's like amazing enough. But there's plenty more, as we can see. Peaceable. God's wisdom makes the Christian love peace, not just peaceable, but you love peace, and do all that he or she can to maintain peace without sacrificing purity. Did you catch that? It makes the Christian love peace and do all that he or she can to maintain peace without sacrificing purity. And here's the real kicker, even at the expense of your own comfort. Our culture talks a lot about tolerance and acceptance, and our culture seems to have gotten confused on this by making both of those words mean the same thing. Tolerance and acceptance are two very different things. As Christians, we can tolerate the world and love them. We don't need to accept them. We can tolerate things like homosexuality and LGBTQ and the rest of the 24 letters that they've stacked onto that. And now they say that there is no such thing as gender. Everyone can choose their own gender. We can tolerate that. We can love them. And we can share truth with them. We can serve them. We can do all these things for them and bring them to Jesus no matter what. Against our comfort, we do not need to accept that. We don't accept that. We love you. We don't accept your practice. We love everyone. But we don't accept sin. Because man, if... I'm not going to go there. (laughs) We're going to move on. But you get the idea, right? God's peace, God's peace in God's wisdom makes the Christian love peace without sacrificing purity. And the next word that he uses is gentle. God's wisdom makes the Christian forbearing and not overbearing. Courteous and not crude. A gentleman or gentlewoman as uh, Cammy was called earlier when all of my hands were in stuff for all of my hands, I can have more than two. <laughs> when my hands and, and my body was full and she opened the door and someone called her a gentle woman. A, a respectful person of other people's feelings, right? You're not overbearing. You're not a holy roller, steamroller. You're gentle and forbearing. Now, which brings up boldness, <laughs> right? When people think of Christians being bold, that doesn't necessarily mean you getting up on the table at the mall and start shouting, you know, hellfire and brimstone, and, you know, all bunch of sinners are going to go to hell if you don't repent. Yes, that's true, but don't be overbearing about it. <laughs> there is a way to do this gent- with gentleness. 
Is there a time and a place to do open evangelism like that? Open air evangelism? Absolutely. I've done tons of open air evangelism, often at high schools or in different places, different countries. There is a time and place for open air evangelism for you just to get up on somewhere where people can see and hear you and you start proclaiming the gospel, but in love, not you know what this means. <laughs> trying to communicate my words with this. <laughs> Don't be like this. Be like this. The next phrase that he uses is willing to yield. You have pethes. And it's the only time this Greek word is used in the New Testament. God's wisdom makes the Christian easily obedient. Man, that's a big one. Easily obedient to that which is good. Not to that which is cultural, to that which is good. God's wisdom makes the Christian easily obedient to that which is good, also approachable and open to reason, willing to be corrected and ready to be corrected when confronted with truth. That needs to be true in my life. You can ask my wife. <laughs> Sometimes I'll, I'll jump to a, a conclusion and I'll say, oh no, that, you know, that's wrong, or oh no, that's right, or no, such and such is the case. And then she'll be saying that, no, that's not the case. Such and such is really the case. And will be like, no, I don't think so. And then it turns out, yes, that was the case. <laughs> and so I need to be willing, be willing to be corrected and receive that with gentleness, with meekness, with joy. Thank God for my bride. But this next word that he uses is full, full of mercy. God's wisdom makes the Christian merciful to those who are in the wrong and anxious to help them follow the Lord with you. God's, Christ, God's wisdom makes the Christian compassionate and kind to everyone that they meet. Now, this is something that James talks about earlier in chapter 2. In chapter 2, verse 13, he says, For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What does all that mean? What is God's wisdom making the Christian full of mercy? If you want someone to show mercy to you... <laughs> You want someone to kind of help pick you up when you severely messed up and blown it or, you know, whatever happened to you, and you want people to be merciful to you and graceful to you, you also need to be merciful to other people. Because what does it say? James 2.13, For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. If you want mercy to be given to you, you first need to be giving mercy to other people. Think of it like a bank account. When you invest in other people, specifically with mercy, you're merciful to them, you're gracious to them, you're investing in them, right? It's like you're putting money in the bank, you're making deposits, mercy deposits. And then when you totally blow it, and you have a flat tire in your life, and you just like totally screwed up, that person, you can withdraw mercy from that person. Does that make sense? So invest in people, not just with mercy, but in all kinds of stuff. Invest into people, right? God is in the people business, totally. He's not in the big church or big production business. God is not in the big, you know, whatever business. He's in the people business. People are more important than meetings. People are way more important than you getting to wherever you need to go. People are way more important than fill in the blank. How do we know that? God himself died for people. I think that's pretty important. Now, this next word that he uses or phrase is good fruits. God's wisdom makes the Christian reproduce himself in discipleship. There's a lot to go on here with wisdom, right? God's wisdom makes the Christian reproduce himself in discipleship as a healthy believer, as well as allow the fruit of the Spirit to thrive in his own or her own personal life, which is love. Right? We get all this from Galatians chapter 5. Really, if you were to scratch into the wording and look into the, the Greek wording used there, the Greek wording talks about how the fruit of the Spirit is love, and which produces joy, peace, so on and so forth. Serve everyone. Gentleness, self-control, so on and so forth. And so, God's wisdom helps us have good fruits. Now, Psalm chapter 1. How many of you guys have read Psalm chapter or Psalm 1? I should say chapter 1. Psalm 1. Psalm 1 talks about, we won't flip there, but you can jot it down. I totally recommend you reading it. Psalm 1 talks about how he or she who delights in the law of the Lord is like a 
tree planted by the rivers of water. Have you guys ever planted a tree before? I love all that kind of stuff, like organic gardening and compost. And I love that kind of stuff. It's therapeutic for me. But when you plant a tree, you obviously make sure it's well nourished and it's well watered. Now, this tree planted by a river it is constantly receiving nourishment. And that's what God's Word tells us is the person who delights in the law of the Lord, in the Bible, in the Word of God. And so, what does that mean to us? What does God's wisdom producing good fruits mean to us? Well, here we go. What does an orange tree produce? Gosh, you're so smart. Man, Bible college students. What does an apple tree produce? Lemons. Just kidding. Apples. What does a Christian tree produce? Let's try that again. <laughs> what does a Christian tree produce? Now, we're quick to say the fruit of the Spirit, or we're quick to say love, joy, peace, gentleness, self control. But that's the fruit of the Spirit, right? That's not the fruit of the Christian. What is the fruit of the Christian? It's oranges produce oranges, apples produce apples, Christians produce other Christians. That's the Lord calling. That's the still small voice. Now, this is what the good word is talking about here with regard to what James is saying, God's wisdom. God's wisdom produces good fruits. Yes, the fruit of the Spirit, absolutely right. That's all kind of mixed in here together. But specifically, the good fruits of the Christian, it's reproducing yourself. Now, if you as an individual, obviously I don't know your heart, don't know your mind, don't know any of that kind of stuff. But if you genuinely delight yourself, like if you enjoy reading this book, if you enjoy being at places like this, not just to worship and sing songs, but you love studying His Word, you love enjoying this kind of setting, if you enjoy the law of the Lord, the Bible, you are like a tree planted by a river of water. That's like the living water that we've talked about, right? John chapter 4 and so on. You will reproduce yourself. You will reproduce yourself in discipleship. By telling other people, not just about Jesus, but by actually leading by example to them. Actually being a part of training them up to also follow the Lord and also be a part of their God-given calling. And I think we've talked about this phrase before. We all need three kinds of people in our lives. Who remembers what those three kinds of people are? Yes. <laughs> we all need a Paul. We all need someone to disciple us, someone to pour into us. Often that's a pastor, maybe just a, a father in the faith, like how my youth pastor was. Yes, he was a pastor, he was my father in the faith. Nurturing me, right? Paul was like that to Timothy. We all need someone discipling us first. And we also all need a Barnabas. You guys have read throughout the book of Acts that Barnabas was like Paul's right-hand man. They went together in many, many different places, preaching the gospel, getting beaten up together for the Lord, being in prison for the Lord. Like they did all kinds of stuff for the Lord together. We all need someone who we can link arms with, who we can pray with and confide in, and just really be there for us. Yes? And I don't know who you have. Kirk is like that for me, and I'm going to really be bummed out when he leaves in March. Man, it's good. <laughs> but... We all need someone to link arms with, to serve with. And then we all need a Timothy. We all need someone who we are pouring into, who we are discipling, who we are leading by example to. And so if you don't have those three kinds of people, man, that's got to be fixed. Also, when we pray, and just a bit, be praying, God, how can that be true for me? Now, he goes on, so reproducing yourself, right? That's the good fruit of discipleship. He goes on, he says, partiality. Abdiakritos is the only time also in the New Testament where this word is used. God's wisdom makes the Christian have absolutely no favoritism. To anyone, for any reason, you treat everyone the same. You treat a billionaire the same as the same way that you would treat a homeless guy in your love. You 
treat your best friend the same way that you treat an absolute stranger, in love and in service and compassion. He goes on, he says, without hypocrisy. I think this is pretty self-explanatory. God's wisdom helps us not to be hypocrites. How many hypocrites do you know? All of our hands should go up and really bronze with ourselves. We're one of those. We're the biggest hypocrites we know. I'm the biggest hypocrite I know because I live for myself. I'm 24 7. I'm the only person I've known for that long, right? I know myself, and God knows me. People will say that I don't go to church because it's full of hypocrites, and I love something that Pastor Pete always says. He says, You're absolutely right. Come on with me, there's room for one more. <laughs> Just for you guys, see, just for you. Just kidding. But we're absolutely right. We're all sinners. Unfortunately, we still sin. We're still in this flesh. But God is making us new every day. Every day if we allow Him to. And so that's all of God's wisdom, right? That is a massive amount of information, a massive amount of application. But that can all really be summed up into that one line, right? That anything that is not of God is of Satan. If you really look at anything like that, if you really see the world through that lens, through that biblical lens, and you see the way that Jesus lived his life, the disciples lived their lives, things will become very, very clear, pretty black and white, uh, pretty easily. Now, what's that verse, that first verse that we all read in the very, very beginning of tonight? James chapter 1, verse 5, right? But if any of you lacks wisdom, ask God. Ask God, and he'll give to you liberally. Not liberal like left-wing, you know, <laughs> type of liberal, but no, just unabraded in the old King James language. he just dump it on you like a semi-truck. He will give you wisdom in its fullness if you ask without doubting. Now, this is where we're going to finish up at. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I am thinking, wait, what? That's like a whole other thing, you know, to go through. But bear with me, and this is where we'll finish off as we go through tonight. I know we've got a lot of stuff we're going through. But though, and as you're flipping there, though James doesn't talk about love as a part of God's wisdom, this is really the foundation of God's wisdom. It's right here. And this is where I need all of you to stretch, you know, do a little wiggle, and get the blood flowing. I need you to hang tight with me here for this last part, because this is the foundation of wisdom. This love is the foundation to all of these things that we just talked about. And so someone please read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, to the first sentence of verse 8. 4 to the first sentence of verse 8, loud and clear. Now, we know that God is love, right? We know that from 1 John. God is love, so he perfectly fulfills all of this. And how do we know that? Look at Jesus. Jesus is God. He fulfills all of these things. But let's take this a step further. And many of you have probably already done this, but if you've never done this, I really hope and pray this blows your mind and it makes some changes in your life. Everywhere you see the word love in that passage that we just read, put your own name there right now. And then read it like that. So take a moment to do that. Put your own name where you see the word love and read this passage that way. Sean suffers long and is kind. Sean does not envy, Sean does not parade himself, and he's not puffed up or arrogant. Sean does not behave rudely, he does not seek his own, he's not provoked, he thinks no evil, he doesn't rejoice in iniquity, but he rejoices in the truth. He bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. 
I've already failed pretty much all of those. And I certainly can't say that last phrase. Because I do fail. This is an excellent test, right, for all of us. Can this passage with our name in there be true? No. But do we want it to be true? Yes, I really hope so, that we all sincerely say yes. And so, as we pray right now, we can have the worship team now come on back up. But man, let this resonate, because we've talked a lot about wisdom, and contrasting that from demonic wisdom, we've gone through that phrase about anything that's not of God is of Satan. We've talked about all these things, but the foundation of God's wisdom is love. Without love, Paul says prior, this is all for nothing. You're just like clinging symbols. You're just noise if you don't have love. And so think about this passage. And continually, I would encourage you, and I try to do this often. I try to put my name there often and pray this into reality for me that I would be loving, I would suffer long, I wouldn't be provoked. And man, that's a hard thing. Because it doesn't say, don't be easily provoked. It says, literally, do not be ever, ever, ever. I think we can all agree that's a tough, that's a tough, <laughs> tough one. But we ought to pray these things into reality. Amen? Amen. Man, that was, that was kind of weak. Hang with me. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Let's let this be true for us. And so let's pray. Father, man, Lord, we've gone through a lot uh, in your word. We've heard a wonderful testimony about what you're doing in one of our brother's lives, Lord, I'm sure we could all get up here and share different things about what you're doing in our lives, how you're working in miraculous ways. And Lord, we know that you're working in ways that we, we can't even see. But when we look back, when we go to be with you and we look back at this life, we'll then see very clearly, 2020, all the things that you've done for us when we weren't noticing it. Lord, we need your wisdom in this day and age more than ever. We know that the world is getting darker and darker and more and more perverse. There is so much sin and so much just boasting of sin and calling evil good and calling good evil. And there's so much confusion because of this selfishness and leadership. God, there are so many things in turmoil in all areas of life, from politics to economics to social and economic structures, family structures, all kinds of structures, Lord, are crumbling around us, Lord. We need your help to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And Lord, we need your wisdom. God, we need your wisdom right now. We're going to take you up on that offer of James 1.5. You say just to ask you for wisdom with no doubting and you will give it to us. You will just dump godly wisdom on us. And so right now, all of us say in one accord, God, I want your wisdom. God, I want your wisdom. God, I want your wisdom. Please, please make yourself known to us. Make us more loving, ultimately. And so, Father, we lift up all these things to you. We want to be good witnesses, Lord. We want to be good workers. Help us not to just be comfortable with just Sunday mornings or just college group or just not serving. God, help us to seek for more. And so, Lord, we love you. We thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for this time we've gotten to have in your word. Thank you for family in Christ. Thank you for all of this, Lord. And help us to beckon other people, to draw other people to this as well. We pray all these things in the name and for the glory of Jesus. Amen. God bless. I love you guys.